for him tonight. So we are inviting you, Pastor Douglas. Thank you so much. Ahead. Though we have one question, I think it's uh, one very important question. And uh, someone actually asked, uh, what is the difference between repentance and forgiveness? What is the difference between repentance and forgiveness? For those of you who were here, I believe it was the second night, I actually talked about um, God's end time people and what makes them successful in not wandering after the beast. And we found out that night that the one thing that made them successful was the mere fact that their faith was riveted in Jesus. Can you say amen? And the Bible describes them as those that have the faith of Jesus. That's the only thing that makes them successful in not following the majority into this deception. Nothing else. And so you remember that night I mentioned to you from scripture that the way that people have faith in Jesus, first one must come to Jesus. And the Bible makes it clear that there is only one way you can come to Jesus. Can anybody guess what that way is? Just as you are, there is no other, biblically there is no other way that you can come to Jesus but just as you are. Then we found out that night that when you come to Jesus, when we come to Jesus, just as we are, the Bible says in the book of Acts that he gives us a gift. And that gift is the gift of repentance. Repentance in the Bible, you can, you can someone actually uh, received a concordance, you can actually look repentance over and over again in scripture. Repentance in the Bible simply means a U-turn. You think of a U-turn, uh, you know, when you're heading down, when you're heading down uh, the wrong direction and you finally find out that you're heading in the wrong direction, what ought ye to do? You, you, you make, yeah, first you stop, yes. You know, you stop, you know, uh, you, know you, you make a U-turn, right? And, and that's really what repentance is. You know, this funny story comes to my mind. I was actually on my way to Nashville, and I feel a bit embarrassed to say this, but uh, it illustrates the point. Uh, and so uh, I was driving up to Nashville, and uh, I was getting a bit hungry, so I turned off and I grabbed me, uh, I think it was uh, uh, some Impossible Whopper at Burger King, can you say amen? And so, uh, and the Whopper was so delicious that I, I, you know, I lost orientation. I, I lost, I lost where I was at. You know, I didn't know east from west and north from south. And so I, you know, I just jumped. I just jumped on the, what I thought uh, was the direction that I was heading. And I kept driving and driving, driving. And I'm all the way to Nashville. And I looked, and then a sign said something like, "A few miles away from Chattanooga." And I thought to myself, no, this, this, this is not right. You know, um, you know I, I praise God my wife wasn't there. Because, you know, I keep telling my wife, you know, I, you know, I don't need a GPS. You know, GPS are for weaklings. I know where I'm going. And so I pulled out my GPS. And uh, I pumped in the, di the directions of uh, my destination in Asheville. And, you know, if, depending on what, what phone you have, it, it has these two blue lines. You know, one line goes saying that you need to make a U-turn. And still... You know, in my stubbornness, I said, no, the GPS is wrong. You know, the GPS is wrong. I mean, who was that person that put that sign there? And so, long story short, um, you know, I finally made a U-turn. I knew, I knew that if I needed to get back on the right track, I needed to make a U-turn. Can you say amen? And ladies and gentlemen, whether we like it or not, so you know, the Bible says we are all heading in the wrong direction. And the Bible says we have no power in and of our own selves to make that U-turn. The Bible says it's a gift God gives it. That simply implies that if God gives us something, you never had that thing in the first place. You know, there's no, there's no repentance in and of our own selves. It comes from God. But we must come to God just as we are. And he gives us that U-turn, the power to turn away from sin. And so repentance is simply a, a U-turn, a turning away from sin. Something that, that God gives us. Forgiveness, on the other hand, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The easiest and the most simplest way I like to define, uh, define forgiveness is simply this. Forgiveness, forgiveness is a transaction. It's a what? It's a transaction. You, when, you, when, you go, when, you, uh, when you go and uh, make a transaction at Walmart or somewhere, uh, you know, you, you give, uh, you give the, the person behind the counter something, in return they give you something. That's a transaction. And forgiveness is simply a transaction. When you come to Jesus, 
When you confess your sins, there's a transaction. You give to God your sins and your guilt, and in return, God gives you his righteousness and his purity. Right there at that time. That's forgiveness. Can you say hallelujah? That's grace. You know? So, so forgiveness is simply a transaction. You give to God. We give to God our sinfulness. And in return, no questions asked, he gives us his purity and his righteousness. That's the God we serve. So when we come to God, you know, when we have an intent uh, not, to, not to sin and, and, uh, and, and not to fall back into that, that's a gift that only God gives. He gives us that repentance and he cleanses us and forgives us from all sin. Praise, the, praise God that we have a loving Savior that wants to save us into his kingdom. Can you say amen? So may God bless us and may God keep us as we continue studying his word. Thank you so much. So as you know, we are studying God's word here. That's why we're here. And uh, we call this uh, our spiritual bread, right? And uh, we, we need to eat that bread. And so uh, just to, to help you see how important it is in our daily life, I will um, briefly share with you, actually for tonight, tomorrow, and Thursday night, I'll share a little bit about my father who had to spend years in prison for being a pastor. But there is a verse in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, when Jesus is saying in verse 35, I am the bread of life, it says. So when, during communism, my dad was arrested being a young man at that time the KGB officers took him straight from his place of work so he couldn't even go home he couldn't get anything that he needed and so they took him to uh, by train to a basement in Moscow in one of the KGB buildings where he would be interrogated for the next uh, uh, several months and then they sent him to prison and just because he was giving Bible studies to a couple of students. And so just imagine a table leader here giving Bible studies to someone and they're being sent to prison because they help you with your Bible study. So he's there and uh, uh, I talked to him after that many times and I was asking, what was, what was the most that you wanted? He said, yes, of course, I was hungry. I was so hungry all the time. Because I was a young man at that time, and uh, I, I wanted food, and I could never find enough food. They were not giving us enough food. They would just give us uh, a little bit of bread. And, um, but then he said, the other thing that I needed more than anything was God's word. Because that's the reason I was in prison. Because of God's word. Because I was sharing God's word. But now... I did not, he was saying, I did not have my Bible. And I just, I was suffering because I could not have my own Bible. I could not read my Bible. And then uh, once every six months or so, they were allowed to write a letter to their family members. And so he said, I wrote a letter to, he wrote a letter to his mom saying, please send me some bread when you send me something next time. So he said, when I wrote, please send me some bread, he said, I knew she would understand that I needed spiritual bread. And, uh, but at the same time, all those packages arrive to the office of that prison, and the officer goes through the content of it, uh, searching for anything illegal, and sending any spiritual literature would be illegal. So when finally that package arrived and the officer invited my dad to come to his office and he started searching through everything that was there in that small box. And then there is a small bag with flour that was uh, sent because they could cook a little bit if they had some of their own food and groceries there. And so he said the officer started sticking his fingers into that small bag with flour and just searching there and everything around and he said as he was sticking his fingers into there my heart started pounding in me and beating fast because I was thinking she probably would be hiding she would probably hid something inside of that bag but uh, 
if, she, if he finds, then I lose it. And so finally the officer shoved that box to my dad and he said, okay, you can take it. And so he took it and he said he found a, pri a quiet corner in, in that barrack where he was living. And he said, I started just searching through everything that was there and pouring that flour out of that plastic bag until he said on the very bottom, folded many times, I found just three pages from the Gospel of John there. The first three chapters from the Gospel of John. And he said, I, I did not care about anything else that was there in that uh, box that I received except that I started memorizing those verses and knowing that they'll take those from me. But I would read and, and memorize so that I would remember every word by heart. And he said they did eventually search and found and took away even those pages from him. But he said they stayed in my heart. And we were little kids and so he was talking to us saying, memorize God's word. Remember it by heart because the day may come when you will have no access to that living word, to that living bread. So I'm telling today, tonight to you, study God's word also. Memorize God's word because the day may come when we'll have no freedom to have our Bibles. But God blessed my dad through that. And uh, later on, he started working on the new Bible translation into contemporary Russian language. I'll share more about it that some other time let us begin with a word of prayer father speak to us once again through your holy spirit and uh may your holy spirit make jesus real in our hearts and in our lives this is our prayer in jesus name we pray amen a young boy was walking through a graveyard one afternoon and as he was walking through the graveyard he was just contemplating about life contemplating about his purpose in life and where God wanted him to be and as he was walking through this graveyard he came across a particular graveyard and uh, he stood uh, he stood at that graveyard and he wondered to himself he wondered to himself what happens to people when they die and as he stood there right there on the headstone of this particular grave of this particular grave were edged the following words it was a unique, interesting poem, and it, reads, and it reads something like this. Stop, my friend, as you go by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon shall be. So prepare yourself to follow me. <laughs> that young lad, he stood there and he grinned to himself and seconds turn into minutes and a few minutes later he wondered to himself about this poem it just so happened he had a little crayon in his uh, pocket so he pulls out the crayon out of his pocket and right underneath that which was edged on that headstone he wrote the following reply he wrote to follow you i'm not content until i know which way you went <laughs> If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Job. The book of Job. I want to show you a verse here in the book of Job, chapter 14, and verse 10. It's very interesting to note, dearly beloved, that the question of this young boy is really nothing new. As a matter of fact, Job asked that question too. As we're reading from the 10th verse or the 14th chapter of the book of Job, page 488 of the Bibles that are on your tables. In the Old Testament, page 488, the Bible says here, in Job chapter 14 and verse 10, this is Job speaking, he says, But man dies and is laid away, and indeed he breathes his last. And where is he? Here Job asks the question, when a man dies, when a person dies, he breathes his last breath. But the question that Job is pondering to himself is, then where does he go after that? Ladies and gentlemen, this has been the question of all ages. Pastors and theologians and laity and people have asked themselves, what happens to people when they die? Where do they go? 
See, this is really no new question. It goes way back to the time of Job. And it's sad to report, ladies and gentlemen, that there are so many people out there who are living in uncertainty, not knowing where their loved ones have gone. I was actually having lunch with a lady this afternoon, and this lady's uh, father was a minister, and she was actually telling me a story one day as they were walking around their neighborhood. They came across this one house. His dad, being a faithful missionary and evangelist, just goes up and knocks on the door. Man comes out, asks what he wants. He, they just start talking. He says he's a, uh, he's a minister of the gospel. The man behind the door, when he finds out and hears that he's a minister of the gospel, tears start coming down his eyes. And he says to this man, he says, you know, I lost my wife a few months ago. And as a minister of the gospel, I'm asking you, where is she? Where is she? Is she floating somewhere in Neverland? Is, where is she? Is she in heaven? Is she in hell? You see, ladies and gentlemen, there are people today who are living in uncertainty, not knowing where their loved ones have gone. But I praise God that He's given us His Word. And His Word does not leave us in darkness. His Word does not leave us guessing about what happens to people when they die. God doesn't want us living in uncertainty. God wants us to live with absolute clarity of what happens to people when they die. You know, there are so many views out there concerning what happens to people when they die. Some people believe that when a person dies, they go directly to hell, depending on the kind of life that they live. Some people believe that when a person dies, they go directly to heaven. You see, there are so many different views out there. Some people believe that when you die, you go to this kind of halfway house between heaven and hell called purgatory. And depending how much money your, your, your loved ones uh, give to the church that are still alive will determine whether you go to hell or whether you go to heaven. So many different ideas and concepts out there about what happens to people when they die. Some people believe that when you die, they believe in this thing called reincarnation. Depending on the kind of life that you live, uh, you know, determine it will determine the kind of life that you will have in the afterlife. Some people believe that when you die, you will either come back as an ant or as a cow or wherever it is, whatever it is. I remember one time I was in India running meetings similar to this. And um, I was out there in the, in the marketplace and the people who came from the farms, they were bringing their fruits, their vegetables. And as I stood there, I noticed that there was this cow just roaming from booth to booth and eating all the vegetables that it delighted to eat. And so I turned to my translator and I said to my translator, why aren't the people chasing away this cow from their booth? So he began to explain to me, so oh, you don't understand. You see where I live and the people that I uh, associate with, they believe that the reason why they don't push this cow away from their booth is because they could be turning away their grandfather. They could be turning away their mother. They could be turning away their uh, uncle or their auntie. Because they believe that when a person dies, it comes back in the form of a cow. You know, I turned to my translator and I said, you know what? If I ever believed in reincarnation, I would like to come back as a cow and live in India. <laughs> I don't want to be a cow in America. I know what they do to cows in America. <laughs> so I, I said to him, I said, if I ever come, he says, I want to be a cow in India. He says, you see, I have rights in India. Cows don't have rights in America. So, so many people believe in different things concerning reincarnation. Some people believe that when you die, that's it. That's the end of life. Nothing happens. You breathe your last breath and that's simply it, dearly beloved. Well, you see, we're studying this week the book of Revelation. And the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. And it reads, this is Jesus speaking here. And he says, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive for how long, dear friends? I am alive forevermore. Amen. And Jesus says here, and I have the keys of Hades or, or hell, the keys of hell and death. You see, dearly beloved, when it comes to the subject of what happens to people when they die, there is no other person that has walked the face of this earth that qualifies to know about the truth about death than Jesus himself. He has the keys of hell and death. 
So if there's any person we ought to turn our attention to and ask about death, it's none other than Jesus. Come with me in your Bibles to the book of John chapter 11. Let's go here to Jesus himself. Since Jesus has the keys of hell and death, let's see what Jesus says, not what some church says or what some denomination says or what I say. We want to hear from the one who holds the keys of hell and death and see how he defines and explains what death simply is. John chapter 11. I want us to read here beginning from verse 1. This is page 1038 in your Bibles. John chapter 11. And beginning with verse 1. Notice what the Bible says here in John chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of... Uh, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Verse 2. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now I want you to notice the scene here. Notice here the context says here that Jesus was talking with his disciples and uh, he was teaching his disciples and in the middle of the disciples, the Bible says approximately two miles away, there were two miles away, uh, uh, some people come and uh, bring the bad news that, that Lazarus is sick. And notice what it says here in verse 3. Therefore, the sister sent to him, Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you loved... Is sick. I want you to mark those words there. Behold, he whom you loved is sick. I find these words profound because you know what that means, dear friends? That tells me that those whom God loves still get sick and die. Those whom God loves still go through some sort of sickness. Now there may be someone here under the sound of my voice tonight who may be going through some sort of sickness in your life. And you've given all that you've got. You've given everything that you have to God. You've given God your heart. You've sacrificed for the cause of God. And you're wondering to yourself, after all I've done for God, why doesn't God give me immunity from sickness and death? Well, here the Bible says, dearly beloved, that even whom God loved experienced sickness and death. And whatever you may be experiencing tonight, I want you to have faith in God. I want to let you know that God still loves you. Even though you may be going through some sort of invasive disease, even though you may be experiencing something and you've been faithful to God, dearly beloved, I'm here to give you hope that Jesus still hears and answers your prayers. So the Bible says here, he whom you love is sick. Then verse 4, the Bible says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now notice what verse 6 says. So when he heard that he, Lazarus, was sick, the Bible says Jesus left immediately. What does it say? He stayed two more days. You know, I was just reading this this evening. I wonder to myself, that doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, what would you do naturally as a human being? When you, if you hear that your loved one is about to pass, if your father or your mother or your auntie was about to pass, we as human beings, and I've seen and I've heard this before, and I've even done it myself. When my dad passed away, guess what I did? I dropped everything. I dropped everything that I had, and I flew all the way back home. But not so with Jesus. You see, we must understand. We'll probably be wondering to ourselves, why doesn't he do that? You see, dearly beloved, our mortal minds must understand that when it comes to God and his relationship with human beings, God's ways are not our ways. And God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And so God, Jesus, wanted to use this situation to glorify him. You may be going through some struggles, and you may be going through some trials in life, and you're probably wondering to yourself, why is it that God hasn't heard and answered my prayers? Be patient. Have faith. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And at the end of time, you're going to look back and say, praise God that I went through that trial and that persecution. Can you say amen? So here the Bible says that Jesus stayed. Jesus waited for two more days. Now jump down to verse 11. These things said he, these things he said, and after that he said to them, 
our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Now at this point, Lazarus had gone from being sick, now he's dead. And now Jesus says to the disciples, he says, look, fret not, Lazarus is simply sleeping. Verse 12, then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his, of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking a rest and sleep. Verse 14. Then Jesus, you see the disciples, you see the disciples could not understand what Jesus was referring to when he was saying, look, Lazarus is simply sleeping. And ladies and gentlemen, there are many Christians today who still don't understand the truth about death, just like the disciples. So now Jesus had to just make it plain and clear. Notice what he says here in verse 14. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. I praise God that the Bible doesn't leave us in darkness. You see, dearly beloved, Jesus simply defines here death as being a sleep. And notice what Jesus says concerning Lazarus. The Bible says the moment that Lazarus died, he was simply sleeping. The moment a person dies, Jesus doesn't say they go to heaven. The moment that a person dies, Jesus doesn't say they go to hell. The moment a person dies, Jesus doesn't say that their spirit lingers somewhere between heaven and earth. No, the Bible is clear. Jesus says that when a person dies, they're simply sleeping. And it's very interesting to know, dearly beloved, that over 50 times in Scripture, how many times? There are 50 times in Scripture, death is often referred to as a sleep. The death is a sleep. Death is a sleep. Death is a sleep. So the Bible makes it very clear. Jesus the person who has the keys of hell and death, the one and only person that is qualified to tell us the truth about death has made it clear that death is simply a sleep. You know, some of you may be wondering, and I've heard people often come up and say, well, doesn't the Bible say that our, that our souls and our spirits are immortal? Doesn't the Bible say that we keep living forever and ever, our soul keeps lingering? Well, it's very interesting to note, dearly beloved, Time does not suffice me to go through this, but you can actually study this yourself. The word soul and spirit is mentioned over 1,700 times in Scripture. Soul and spirit. And not once, not once does it refer to it, soul and spirit, as being immortal. As a matter of fact, the Bible makes it clear that our soul and our spirit actually comes to the point where it actually dies. Ezekiel speaks about that. I want you to come with me to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. Ezekiel, notice what Ezekiel says here. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 18, we were in the book of Ezekiel a few nights ago talking about Lucifer. And I want us to go back, we were talking about Lucifer in the book of Ezekiel, but I want you to notice here uh, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. Notice what Ezekiel says concerning our soul. The Bible says here in Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4, this is page 817 of your Bibles that are on your tables. And it reads, Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father, verse 4, the soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son is mine. Then Ezekiel says here, the soul who sins shall live forever. Is that what the Bible says? The Bible says that the soul who sins shall die. So they, 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 the Bible makes it very clear that there does come a point in our life that our soul will cease to exist. Therefore, the Bible simply implies that if a soul ceases to exist at one time, it cannot live forever. As a matter of fact, come with me to the book of 1 Timothy because the Bible tells us that there is only one being who is immortal. Our souls and our spirits are not immortal. Notice what the Bible says concerning the one who is immortal. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17. Notice here what Timothy says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17. This is page 1,140 of your Bibles. 1,140 of your Bibles in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1 what chapter are we on chapter 1 and I want you to notice what Timothy says here 
in the, uh, verse 16. Then we're going to jump over to chapter 6 because he's actually talking about the same thing. So we know here that a soul will die, which simply implies that a soul cannot live forever. It will come to a point where it actually cease to exist. Then in verse 17, it reads, Now to the king. Now let's read verse, uh, let's just read verse 16 uh, because uh, just to get some context here. However, for the reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe in him for everlasting life. This is talking about Jesus. Now to the king eternal, what's that word? Immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory for and ever. So the Bible makes it very clear that there's only one being. There's only one being who is immortal, and that's God himself. So you see, Ezekiel was right. You see, a, 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 a soul cannot be immortal because only God is immortal. Let's go over to chapter 6 and verse 16. Chapter 6 and, uh, and verse 16. Notice what it says here. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, this is uh, 1,142, and... Uh, verse 16. Well, let's read verse 15 and 16, and it reads, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is blessed and the only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I praise God that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. What do you say? Then the Bible says, who alone has what? Has immortality, the Bible says, who alone by himself has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light to whom man has not seen. So the Bible makes it very clear that there's only one being who is immortal, and that is God. As a matter of fact, I want to show you later on, dearly beloved, that there will come a time, there will come a time where we as human beings can be immortal. The Bible says that will only come at the second coming of Jesus. When this mortal shall put on immortality. But as of, as of right now, dearly beloved, we are susceptible to death. The Bible makes it very clear that when we die, we are sleeping in Jesus. Jesus says Lazarus is sleeping. He's not in heaven. He's not in hell. He is simply sleeping. See, when it comes to the subject of death, dearly beloved, we must understand what happens when a person is created. Now, I want you to notice here the question we're asking tonight. You see, how did God create man? For it's understanding creation, it's understanding how God created man, that we have some more of a bit of an insight about how a person dies and what happens to a person when they die. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 7. Notice what it says here in Genesis chapter 2. What verse are we on? Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And it reads, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a what, friends? Man, now notice this is in the plus factor. So the Bible makes it very clear that mankind, you and I, no matter where we come from, no matter what background we have, no matter what color of our skin, no matter what financial status we may be, the Bible says mankind is simply made up of two elements. Not three, simply two elements. Notice what the Bible says, what element number one is. And the Lord God formed man out of, what's element number one? From the dust of the ground. That's element number one. Then the Bible says, and breathe into his nostrils. What's that second element? The breath of life. That's element number two. Then the Bible says that when we have these two elements compounded together, or when these two elements come together, the Bible says that man becomes a what? equals a living soul. So the Bible makes it clear that mankind is simply made of two elements. What are those two elements? The dust of the ground and what, friends? The breath of life equals a what? A living soul. That's really what it means, dear friends. So you see, dearly beloved, soul in the Bible, another word for soul in the Bible is simply referring to a person or life. Now notice there, I emphasize that we are simply made up of two elements. The Bible doesn't say that man is made of dust of the ground, breath of life, plus there's a soul inside of you. Is that what the Bible says? No, no, no. We're only made up of two elements. You see, if there was a soul inside of us, 
then we would have been made up of three elements. But the Bible makes it clear we're only made up of two elements. Dust of the ground, breath of life, that's it. So it's very interesting that in the Bible, the word soul is not referring to something that lingers in the air between heaven and earth. In the Bible, the word soul is simply referred to as a person or, a, or life or a living being. Let me give you an example here. In the book of Acts chapter 27 and verse 37, the Bible says, and we were in all, uh, and we were in all in the ship 200, three score and 16 what, friends? Now, of course, the Bible talks about those people that were in that boat with that 2,316 souls. In other words, 2,316 people, lives, not referring to spirits that lingering in the air. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 5. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 what? Were 70 souls. In other words, 70 people, 70 beings, 70 lives, okay? Not a spirit. For Joseph was in Egypt already. Now suppose one day I were to go to the local mall. And uh, as I'm going to the local mall, uh, I notice that uh, it's pretty empty. It's pretty scarce. And you were to call me, suppose, one day. You were to call me and to find out how many people were at the mall. And if I were to say to you, and I'll say, look, uh, I'm here at the Hamilton Mall, and I'm just letting you know, there's not a single soul here. Now, what am I referring to? Am I referring to spirits? I'm referring to people. Can you say amen? It's not a single soul here. So soul in the Bible is not referring to a spirit. It's actually referring to a person, a living being. That's really what it means. So you see, dearly beloved, the Bible tells us that the breath of life, what is the breath of life that God breathed into man? Well, the Old Testament in the Hebrew word is spirit or ruach, which just simply means breath. That's what the breath of life is. It's just simply a, a breath. Now, notice what Job chapter 27 and verse 3 says. What book is this saying? Job chapter 27. And notice what it says here in verse 3. All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is where? In my nostrils. He's talking about his breath. Now think about it, dear friends. If a breath was a living entity, how is it possible that a living entity could live in your nostrils. Think about it. It doesn't make sense. So you see, dearly beloved, the word breath here in the Bible is just simple. Spirit is just simply referring to the breath of God coming out of our nostrils. You see, dear friends, the Bible makes it very clear that mankind is made from the dust of the ground plus the breath of life equals a living soul. You see, once we understand how God created us, we will therefore have some insight to what happens to a person when they die. So what happens to a person when they die? Ecclesiastes, what book does it say? Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. The Bible says, when we die, the dust shall what? Return to the earth as it was. And the spirit, what's the spirit? Is it a living entity that lives in your nostrils? No, it's the breath of God. It's the breath of a person returning back to God. The Bible says, And the spirit of the breath shall return unto God who gave it. So you see, dearly beloved, death is simple this. Simply this. Death is simply creation in reverse. You see, when God created us, He made us of two things. Dust of the ground, the breath of God equals a living soul. And so when a person dies, creation is simply being reversed. The dust goes back to the ground. The, the breath of the Spirit of God returns back to God. And all you have is simply a corpse that is sleeping, awaiting the second coming of Jesus. That's all you have, dearly beloved. Lazarus is asleep. How much do we know when a person dies? Well, again, the Bible doesn't leave us in darkness. Notice what it says here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And verse 5, what books does it say? Ecclesiastes, write this down. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 5. The Bible tells us clearly, and it reads, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know everything. Is that what it says? What does, it say? What does the Bible say? The dead know everything. 
nothing. That's what it says. Notice what the Bible says here. Also their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. You see, dearly beloved, when a person dies, um, they do not even praise God. I'm going to show you right here. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Where, friends? In the grave, with us, wherever thou goest. Here the wise man Solomon simply saying this. Look, you better work hard now. You better get everything you've got now. Because the moment you breathe your last breath, that's it. You know nothing. You have no love. You have no hatred. You have no memory. You won't even know where you live. You won't even know who's who. The Bible says that when you sleep, you are, when you die, you are sleeping, awaiting the second coming of Jesus. The Bible continues to say in the book of Psalm, uh, chapter 6 and uh, verse 4. Notice what it says here in the book of Psalm, chapter 6, verse 4. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? In other words, the Bible says the dead, they don't even know. They don't eat. They don't sleep. They, I mean, they're just simply, they're just simply uh, unconscious. Psalm 115. Psalm 115. And notice what the Bible says here in the book of Psalm 115 and verse 17. And it reads, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down where? They go down where, friends? Into silence. So in other words, into the grave. You know, I, uh, I, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, but I, you know, my family... Uh, we, we really, we really, we really read the Bible. We were just Christians by tradition. And uh, uh, I remember living uh, next door to this, uh, to this family. Really good. We're, we're still good friends still today. And, uh, and they, they had a very interesting, they had a very interesting uh, a ritual that they would do. And so I was only, I was only like six, seven years of age. And um, my friend, he said that his dad had passed away. And he said that uh, every night we give food to our dad. And I was only, a, imagine, I was only a six, seven, naive year old kid. And I said, really? I mentioned to you last night, I love to eat. Can you say amen? And so I said, really? He says, yeah, you know, I, you know we, we give food to our dad every night outside the house. There's actually a picture of him and uh, we, we bring the food out and then the next morning it's gone. And I says, really? And I'm a six, seven-year-old kid. And I said, how does that happen? Well, you know, his spirit comes back, and he eats, and he goes back, he goes back to where he's at. And, uh, and I said, well, I, I, you know, I, I was just so curious. I just, I got to see this. I really got to see this. And so I decided one night I was just going to wake up until I see his dad coming to eat his food. And so he, he lived adjacent to where, where, where I lived, across the road. And, and uh, in the middle of the night, I remember I came out, I looked, and I just waited. And I waited, and I waited. And I waited for him to come eat his food. And there was a plate of nice, delicious food. And I thought to myself, if, he's, if he doesn't come, I'm going to go over there and eat it myself. <laughs> and I kept looking at my life. I was like, this, this, this is taking too long. And so, and so I, I stood there and I waited in the middle of the night, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, I think it was somewhere around 2, 3 in the morning. And I watched and I watched and you, you wouldn't believe what I saw. You wouldn't believe it. I saw the cat from next door jump over the fence, climb the fence, and demolish that food. And, uh, and I said to myself, you know, I, and I, I, so my friend the next day, and I, and I, I said to him, I, I actually didn't want to tell him. I didn't want to tell him what I saw. And, uh, but he, you know, he kept believing, he kept believing that, you know, his physical dad in spirit would actually come and eat the food. And I didn't tell him there was actually the cat from next door. And, uh, and, so, and so, dearly beloved, the Bible makes it clear that when a person dies, they don't have an appetite, they don't, they don't, they don't love, you know, they don't talk. The dead know nothing. Can you say Amen. They are sleeping, awaiting the second coming of Jesus. Now let's go over, let's go over to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So when a person dies, do they go directly to heaven? Well, notice what it says here in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 
and verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. This is page 1137 uh, of the, your Bibles. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and uh, verse, let, let, let's actually read verse 15 because verse 15 gives us some sort of context here. For this we say, 1137, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will be by no means proceed or go before those who are asleep. Now, is Paul talking about here a literal sleep or is he talking about here a symbolic sleep? He's talking about death. He's simply saying, look, we're not going to go ahead of those that are sleeping in the graves. And he begins to explain why. He says here in verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice uh, of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ. Who are the dead in Christ? Lazarus, those who are sleeping. The Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Can you say amen? So the Bible makes it very clear that those who are sleeping have not gone directly to heaven. As a matter of fact, they are awaiting the trumpet sound of God. When the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up into there. They're awaiting the second coming of Jesus. That's where they're at. Let me give you an example. Come with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. Here's one example of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So 1 Thessalonians, we kind of see the theology of what happens to a person when they die. But let's see it in action. Notice what the Bible says here uh, in the book of Acts. Notice what it says. Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 29. Acts, all the in the New Testament again. Notice what it says here in the book of Acts chapter, what chapter are we on? Acts the second chapter and, uh, and verse 29. And it reads here, concerning King David. If you often wonder to yourself what happened to King David when he died. Notice what it says here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 29. 29 and it reads men and brethren let me speak freely to you of the patriarch david that he is both dead and buried in his where does the bible say he's in heaven no the bible says in his tomb with us to this day now jump down to verse 34 now notice what verse 34 says for david did not ascend into the heavens isn't that interesting so the bible makes it very clear that david is in the tomb he did not ascend to heaven. When we cross-reference this with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Bible makes it very clear that David too, like Lazarus, is sleeping in the grave awaiting the trumpet sound of God. That's where he's at. Jesus is coming soon. I want to be ready. How about you? Well, people often say, well, Pastor, doesn't the Bible say that the thief in the cross, didn't he go to heaven the day that he died? Well, let's go there to the book of Luke chapter 23. As a matter of fact, you can find that in Luke chapter 23. Notice what it says here concerning this uh, thief on the cross. Luke chapter 23. Notice what it says in the book of Luke. What book are we on? Luke. As a matter of fact, keep your finger there. Let's go over to chapter, nine, uh, chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And uh, notice what it says here. I want to show you this parable that's found in the book of Luke chapter 16. I want to come back to the thief on the cross. Because I've had, I've had people say that, uh, you know, there's actually a story in the Bible concerning uh, about the rich man and Lazarus. Notice what it says here in verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of souls, who was laid at the gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried to the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23, and being in torment in hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off 
and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and he said, verse 24, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Then the Bible continues to talk about Abraham and talk about Lazarus. You know, people often said, well, here you go, Pastor. Doesn't the Bible say that when we die, we go to heaven? Now, I want you to understand. Go back to verse 19. I want to show you something. You see, in verse 19, it says, there was a certain rich man. You notice there that every time Jesus opens up with the phrase, there was a certain man, there was a certain town, there was a certain person. He's actually, refer he's actually talking about a parable. You know, when we talk about a parable, we're not talking uh, literal, we're talking figurative. Can you say amen? So here, the story of Abraham and Lazarus, this is not a true story. It's simply a parable. Now think about it, dear friends. Think about it. If this was a literal, literal story of Abraham and Lazarus, now think about it. That tells us, that, that, then that would mean that somewhere in heaven, there's a place where you could look, you, you could look down and see how. And you could see, you could hear people screaming. Really, would heaven be that joyful if there was such a place? Absolutely not, dearly beloved. You see, this, this, this is actually a parable concerning the rich man, which symbolizes the Jews. And it's all, talking about Lazarus, which is talking about the Gentiles. And you see the, the Jews that had the special blessing of God. And so now Jesus was actually saying, look, take.